Fast and Furious is the franchise's fourth entry, and it's the first film to bring back the original stars and continue the story thread that had largely been left ignored by the prior sequels. As for quality, well, your mileage may vary. Welcome everyone to the Collector's Cut. I am Peter and joining me as always is David. I'm a boy who appreciates a good body, regardless of the make. This is a movie podcast. We get together and we talk about movies. It's really quite that simple. We're working through the first half of the Fast and the Furious franchise. We're doing the second half next year when part 11, the final entry, comes out. But the this... final entry. <laughs> so they say. So this is going to be the fourth movie in the franchise. The movie that is called Fast and Furious where they took out the this and said that was enough. And right before we started, I always get the IMDb page up just so I can look at names if I need to, you know, things mm. like that. And right before we started, I, I tried to search Fast and Furious and everything in the predictive list was every other entry mm -hmm. but this one. So obviously you can add 2009. It'll come up quite quickly. It's not that hard, but it's the principle. It's the principle of the matter. I, I think I've come up with a new idea as to how these titles are generated. Oh, yes. Do, do they over in Scotland have those refrigerator magnets with, like, random words <laughs> printed on it that you can make stupid little sentences out of? Uh, yeah, I guess so. I, I think that whoever's in the marketing department just has the words fast and <laughs> furious to those, and then whatever happens to be on the fridge as they walk out the door that day, that's the next movie. That's uh, that is that is fair. Uh, so we'll start spoiler free as we always do. We'll give you a warning if we wait to spoilers, but of course it is a sequel, so there may be some casual spoilers for earlier entries, even in the spoiler free section. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just just to be expected. This is the well. I'll I'll quote the the poster to set this up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The poster says, uh, "New model, same parts or original parts." So this is the one that actually brings back the main characters from the original film and is very much a twofer between Paul Walker and Vin Diesel now, Brian and yeah. Dom, uh, rather than being solely one person's film. Where the previous three all were, you know, Brian was very much the main character of the first two. Third one was the Alabama kid. <laughs> Have you already forgotten his name? Sean? I've forgotten too. I okay. was asking you. I think it was Sean. <laughs> yeah, Sean sounds right. Um, but here it's both Dom and uh, Brian, which makes sense because, you know, Vin Diesel's kind of a bigger star and mm -hmm. they finally got him back. It feels like that was kind of the, the idea. Uh, but you got some other c characters popping back up as well, which we'll get into. Uh, basic gist of this one is we're kind of back in taking down a bad guy, a criminal uh, sort of bigwig. Right, you know, we kind of joked mm. at the end of the last review that it's sounding kind of similar to the premise of two. It does play out very differently to begin with, but it fundamentally does kind of eventually fall into the same trappings, which is there's a big drug lord type character who uh, both Dom and Brian need to take down for their own reasons. Brian's in the FBI, Dom has a personal reason, and mm. it all kind of builds up, and they, they end up ha working together eventually, although it's kind of, you know, rough early on, and you know, Dom, it is well, exactly what you expect it to be. It, that's yeah, that's a good way of putting it. It is exactly what you expect it to be. Although there was one bombshell about ten minutes out of this movie that made me burst out laughing because we like to joke, uh, just from what we know of the future of this franchise, that it's it's got a bit of a reputation for retconning deaths. Mm -hmm. There was one I didn't know about. That this oh. movie revolves heavily around, which oh, you didn't know. Okay. made me laugh hysterically when they just casually said someone was dead like 10 minutes mm -hmm. in. I went, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Because they're, they're in other movies later on. This is nonsense. <laughs> no, but all those this movie is actually the last one in the timeline. Oh, is it? Okay. It's, it's the, all those other movies happen in between. You just don't know yet. Uh, I, I let out such a laugh. and Because it's clear that when they made this... You know, it was just supposed to be taken seriously. Technically, mm -hmm. yes, you didn't see a body, and if you didn't see a body, there's a chance. But like the movie plays it pretty straight. It's not. Yeah, I, I think what it really all comes down to is 
we're opening the door either way. If this character does not want to return, so be it. If they want to return, we can make it work. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, yeah, we'll talk about that, of course, and we'll get into all the all the other things. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess we'll just start with a simple basic question, though, David, is how did you feel about Fast and Furious 2009? I... I had some real problems with the basic structure of this movie. I think that it was not well paced, I think. Um, the story they wanted to tell was fine, wasn't anything standout. Like we said, it was basically just two all over again, except they got the Vin Diesel back instead of, I forget who it was, wasn't it like Ludacris was filling in? No, 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 he was like a side no. character. No, the actual co-lead of two was someone different. oh yeah yeah yeah. no but i'm just saying it, it's obvious they wanted dom back in the yeah, second yeah. movie here they actually got him back um yeah overall i think it was fun i think it was it's finally feeling like it's getting into what i expect from a fast and furious movie it's getting into that sort of vibe of big bombastic don't think about it too much i think and the opening mm -hmm. scene was like because i actually felt yes. that at the start i was like this opening scene feels like from the later in the franchise and then but then i felt like it kind of like settled back into what the franchise had been mm -hmm. for the rest of yeah. the movie i don't know i think it had a few good moments in there obviously the final set piece was more of that there were some big things there um for me it was the more so down to the characters of Everyone is this tight-knit group, even if they don't want to be. Everyone's working closely together. I think that that's more of what I'm expecting from it, with this ride-or-die sort of crew going on. And I finally feel like that's forming in a more solid way than it was even in the first movie when there was a crew already pre-made. This is the one that feels more... <laughs> well defined there's at least two members of that crew in the first movie that have not returned and yes i don't think we're ever going to see them again but <laughs> exactly exactly my point though is where that was this is where if you... where's Vinny? that's all i'm asking where's Vinny? There, was, there was a point <laughs> earlier on in this movie where dom goes and talks to some guy in a garage and he pulls him out from underneath the car and we see his face and the way they did the reveal i thought we were supposed to recognize him i mm. thought he was like a guy from the first movie and i honestly thought it was like that adhd kid from the first movie but uh, then he, i was like oh wait he got shot yeah he he's definitely, definitely died dead. <laughs> so then i was just like all right it's a new character whatever um but yeah no i think that in general terms do i like this movie i like this movie in the same sort of way that i like any sort of big bombastic dumb action movie in that if I think about it too much, it makes me angry, but I like the movie just from what it's doing, what it's trying to do. Okay, okay. Um, I'm not sure how I really feel about this, which is not to say that I think I may love it. <laughs> Far from well, we it. got an hour and a half to sort that all out. Let's see what I, we got. I, it's, it's more like I'm, I'm somewhere in between apathy, dislike, and... Uh, I suppose. Like, like it's somewhere in that that trinity of feelings. Okay. And I'm not really sure which one I fall on. It, it's not like the first one that I act actively hate, uh, or the third one that kind of I felt was just as bad but in different ways, or mm. like two, which is okay, it's silly, but it's a bit more fun and better paced or whatever. I felt right. like this was kind of, like it was, di it, it had its toes dipped in all three previous movies in one way or another. There was like, elements mm. of two obviously with going after the big bad guy and the way it was building to its climax uh but there was a lot of one as well with like dom's got his anger issues and maybe mm -hmm. he'll want to kill brian at some point because he's he's upset um you know we're not quite at family yet it's funny because we said at the end of the last movie that they used that word for the first time kind of oh, like yeah. that and i feel like no they never said it in this one so i guess five is where family really becomes the thing yep. but we're not there yet so no. It, it 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 did kind of feel like it was mired in some of these these past things. Uh, obviously, like we've got some other sprinklings of cast in here. Like Gal Gadot shows up for the first time. Yeah, uh, I I I saw her on the cast list, and I guess it's just because I know her as a big star nowadays. I expected her to have a much bigger role in this. Right. And then she she was basically relegated to like four scenes 
of a side character that didn't well, really matter think to the plot. When she was cast as Wonder Woman, it was like, oh, it's her from the Fast and Furious movies, you know? Which so, is weird on the other side of that now, yeah. not knowing the Fast and Furious. I'm like, oh, hey, Wonder Woman, you're not wearing a bra, are you? <laughs> well, in that first, yeah, that, I, I noticed that in that one scene, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it was hard not to notice. Yeah. Um, very, very uh, provocative, I suppose. Uh, this whole yeah. movie is full of those little moments, and we'll get to them. But like, I think I, I would have a hard time keeping count of how many times there was just random shots of girls making out with other girls. Oh, not, yeah, there was a few. Not of those. contributing to the plot at all. Yeah, it's just any time we're in a club or we're at a party somewhere, like someone mm -hmm. has to walk past girls making out. Uh, yeah, it just it seemed to be like a rule in this film for some reason. Uh, which is funny because obviously the first movie was 2001 at the start of the decade. This is 2009, right at the end of the decade. So yep. you can sort of feel like, yeah, the world's changed a little bit, but there's still a lot of sensibilities from that first movie. Yeah. Um, and while it's 2009, obviously it was probably shot in 2008 and smartphones were brand new, so everyone still got a flip phone in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just, we're right in that cusp. We're right oh, in that okay. cusp of things changing over in some different ways. Yeah, I, so. Yeah, I didn't really like it. I'm I'm not like angry at it. I don't think like I still think two's probably the best of the four out of these first four, just mm -hmm. because it was the, the light hearted one, I guess. There's a couple of light hearted moments in this, but it still kinda of feels like it's taking itself a bit too seriously with certain See, elements. but that's where I think that's where I think they're finally turning that corner of they're taking themselves seriously, but like they're making a joke out of them taking themselves seriously. I mean, if that, that makes any sense. It, it does at points, but there's still points, there's still like stretches of the movie where I still feel like, oh, I, I don't really care about taking this seriously. So, oh, yeah. Stop, stop I mean, pretending I care about you taking down this bad guy. Stop pretending I care about the tension between right. Dom and Brian, you know, or Brian and Mia. Jesus. <laughs> hey, I mean, that wasn't a thing for like 95% of this movie, and then all of a sudden it was. <laughs> nah, they they wanted tension. The first time they look at each other, it's like, oh, oh, tension. There's history. You feel what it? they wanted and what they got were very different things then, because I wasn't feeling any of that. I was just feeling like, yeah, we kind of had a thing in the first movie, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's talk about your brother some more, because that's where my love truly is. <laughs> oh dear. Um. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a really weird race actually. So there's a, there's the typical we have to find a way to have one just proper street race, mm -hmm. which has a slightly different gimmick this time in that they've not cleared the streets. So it's very much you know you've been playing racing games like Gran Turismo, you've been playing racing games like I don't know Destruction Derby, whatever. Pick your racing games, and then you say no, play Burnout Three where there's traffic as well. You have to dodge. Mm -hmm. That's what they've done here. They're they're, they're, they're giving you the traffic. Um. What's weird about it, though, is that they do this thing where... I, I don't know if, like, sat-nav and GPS was, like, a fresh thing in 2009. I don't know, man. They really, like, did that... So they did this thing where you keep hearing, like, the, you know, the the, the voice. Where, like, uh, you're three miles away from your destination. Uh, you're off-route. Or, so, you know, it, it kept mm -hmm. saying things. And at first Hang I... Hang a U-turn. Hang a U-turn. And I thought it was like, oh, is this just like a stylistic thing for the audience? But at one point, Brian yells at it to shut up because he's sick of hearing it. And I'm like, oh, no, no, they are all hearing this in their cars. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that, all right. Fair enough. Yeah, no, but I just, I have a lot of problems with this GPS just <laughs> being a thing in this world at this point. Because it goes back to plenty of times we've said that there is these little blips in technology these little extra things in the world that some movies throw in there that completely outclass all other tech that exists at that point and we're just supposed to believe yep that's a thing i mean look this at gps is it any computers in the 90s like yeah basically you know and movies pretty much that, that was that was the thing is that but oh this they one, can do this this one like you said it's at that turning point it's at that point where it's like oh like if they had just waited i would say even four more years to make this and had that same GPS, I could believe it. But it's right here, right at this point, that it's just borderline like, nah, it's not there. Well, You're I, making it weird. I'm not even saying that the, the voice is unrealistic necessarily, but it was more the I fact... 
that it, it I'm not can't... talking about the voice. I'm talking about like the whole of the GPS. Yeah, you're talking about the fact that it pulls back and we get like a, a digital, yeah. uh, sh- like wireframe just, version of yeah, the you city. Don't, you don't just see the roads. You see the buildings. You see where the other cars that are driving. You see all this extra stuff thrown around. It's like, man, Google sometimes loses me when I'm in a parking lot <laughs> and it's 2023 and you're telling me all this is happening. Yeah. Also, does G- 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 again, does GPS, like, it doesn't see height, right? No, no. It is It is a satellite, it is a collection of satellites that use three of them to pinpoint your location. That's it. That's all yeah, it is. Yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah, so... I'll, there def- are ones that, there are ones that do elevation, there's a way to get elevation out of it, but it's not useful for driving because you're driving. If your okay. car is airborne, you've got bigger problems than do I turn left on Oak Street. Hey, this is the Fast and the Furious series. Sometimes the cars are very airborne. Yes, and I'm sure they will become more airborne as we progress. Uh, Dom in this movie uh, starts a couple of driving sequences by popping effectively a wheelie like a bike yeah. does, where you, you, the, the front of the car goes up. Oh, God. Usually, when if someone said a car did a wheelie, I would assume it was on its side. I mean, I could see it go either way. I don't know which one my default would be. Just because I've seen this movie right now, I guess it would be the way Dom did it. I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, you know, pop it up like that. Oh, I, I, you say it to me, car does a wheelie, I think Arnold and twins mm. driving for the first time. Like, that. that's the sort of wheelie I'm thinking. That's uh, fair. This was more like... I mean, I'm sure it is, because they did it. It didn't look like CG or anything like that, but I didn't realize a car could physically do this. I mean, the, the whole thing they're going to the reason that it is the way it is is they're trying to sell the idea of all of his engine power is in the rear tires so as soon as he punches it the whole car just wants to kick out from underneath itself Mm. that's the only reason that it's doing it it's not like he presses a button and says wheelie mode (laughs) car should have that button just for the yeah just for the giggles i mean if you got the the tricked out suspension the car so it can like pop and stuff like that i'm sure they could press a button and end up on two wheels for a little bit i will say this i do think that a few of the the way the plot comes together in terms of particularly if, uh, brian's side of it like how he ends up involved and it's like oh we need someone to go into the street race thing i guess mm-hmm. we'll pick brian because we know he's got a history with that that made enough sense to me you know it's like yeah. okay all right so using his expertise there's a whole little sequence after that where the girl who works at the FBI is like, hey, this is all the cars we've got impounded. Which one do you want? And he starts looking at them and sort of like, eh, blah, blah. and I'm like, okay, this makes some sense. He's, he's, it's almost like he's been shackled to just being a regular FBI agent for a while. And this is his yeah. chance a few years later to finally unleash and be like, okay, I get to do this again. So I'm excited mm-hmm. and I'm going to do it. That makes enough sense to me. Actually, the mention has been, I want to say five years. Yep, five years. Right? Which suggests to me that when they made this movie, the plan to have it set before Tokyo Drift was to say that this one was just set a little bit in the past. Uh, mm-hmm. And the reason why I'm saying that is because, like, so the Tokyo Drift kind of, like, connection in this, right? Which is basically just a scene at the start mm-hmm. where, where Han's there and then he goes off. But there's clearly a time jump before we cut to right. the main story, right? Because enough stuff's happened that we hear about later that the clue is a bit of time's passed. So I assumed that Tokyo Drift, when, at least when they made this movie, I'm sure it's, cha- it's changed now because of all these sequels that came after. Yeah. But when they mm-hmm. made this movie, I feel that like the intent was that Tokyo Drift took place in that same time jump. Yeah, I the way that I got it after watching it, and especially because of an explicit line from Han saying... Crazy stuff's going on in Tokyo. Yeah, he literally says, I'm off to Tokyo, by law. <laughs> yeah, the order of events had to be, in my mind, Fast and Furious 1, and then, honestly, probably the first 10 minutes of this movie happened there. Then Fast and Furious 2, Tokyo Drift, and then the rest of this movie. Oh, you think 2? Okay, all right, all right. Just just because there was, it, it's obvious there was a massive time gap between the first 10 minutes of this movie and the rest of it. I'm assuming... I mean, with it's not spoilers if it's really in the first 10 minutes, but at the end of Fast and Furious 1, Dom, on his own, escapes down to Mexico. And he is driving his car down there. At the beginning of this movie, 
his entire crew, and by crew, crew, I mean Han, Letty, himself, and, like, three randos that I don't think we ever see again, really? No, no, the, you do see a couple of them right at the very end. Right, right at the very end, but not, that. like, for the plot. Um, that crew is all together in the Dominican Republic. And then they they do their thing there, time passes again, and Dom's now in Panama. So... So you think a lot of time has passed. So you think the post credit scene from one is also set like after the opening 10 minutes of this movie? I don't know. That's what was thinking because a lot of this movie is set in Mexico. I think it Mm. could be explained at that point. Mm. But I also don't think it really makes a difference. Uh, It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And like we're saying, all this timeline stuff we're doing, we're all, we're, we're arguing all this based on the thinking at the time when just this movie existed, not when five, six, so on existed. Because obviously, yeah. the fact that Five's going to exist, and I think they're going to bring in Han, <laughs> yeah. which then says, okay, all of this has to take place before Tokyo Drift, uh, you know, and then I think even another one after that. So yeah, clearly, the, the timeline slid a little bit uh, around, but I think that was the intention if, if at I the was time. Watching, if I was watching this movie with no knowledge of anything else that happens, I would say three definitely has to happen in the gap. They have to do the opening scene. Han says, I'm going to Tokyo. And then the reason that I put it so early is because Han obviously has to build up a life in Tokyo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has to get involved. So that's why I think it happened nearly immediately after one. Two happens, Tokyo Drift happens, rest of four happens. Okay. That's that's what we'll go with with the puzzle. Yep. Uh, for right now. Which obviously, we know, sitting here in 2023, we're wrong. Oh, yeah, yeah, we know this is wrong. This is yeah. just what the thinking was at the time. Yes. So, uh, throw that all out. Doesn't matter, I suppose. Yep. <laughs> but it was interesting to think about. And, uh, yeah. Do we just give spoiler warning? Because I, I don't know what else to say without spoilers. I... Um, I mean, the only things I really want to throw out here are, one, the acting from our leads, particularly our two main leads and our villain. Yes. Uh, I think Vin Diesel obviously was the best out of anyone here i think he had okay. some i think he had some good points to really sell the emotion you know i'm going to give paul walker a slight yes. compliment a very slight mm-hmm. compliment in that because they're not trying to have him pretend to to be as uh so eager like he's a mm-hmm. bit more he's he's got a haircut he's a bit more sort of dialed in he doesn't come off as poor as he did before now I want to make this clear. He's not a good actor here, but he's not been pushed into like moments and scenes that expose him as much as the previous right. two films, is what I'm trying he doesn't, to say. He doesn't feel like he's trying to be that kid mm-hmm. that's out in the audience of like, oh, I, I wish I could be as cool as, as Brian. It's like, no. Brian is a fed. You're not supposed to relate with him anymore. We're now hoping that you relate over to Vin Diesel's character. <laughs> Yes, this the hulking man who yes uh, has women throwing themselves at him and uh, can at a ridiculous level, mind you. Yes. But regardless, um, uh, and then our villain, the um, who I he's... know from Alien vs Predator Requiem. Wow, that must be the highlight of his career. <laughs> he's been in a couple of things, but that's that is like I was. Like, I know your face from something, and I was Fair like, enough. oh, he's in that. Jesus, um, our villain. And it's it's a thing of we basically spend all of our time with the underling to the villain of yes. Campos. Um, he is fine, but I also don't think much like our villain in not three, two, two in two was not quite given enough time to really make a mark. Yeah, there's another sub-villain as well, uh, Phoenix, who's played by yes. Laz Alonso, who most people will probably know from The Boys. Uh, he's on that. That's right, uh, that is him. Yeah, it, it, do you know what? It, it, you don't get it quite away, because obviously this is quite some time ago, and he's a mm-hmm. bit skinnier here, but it is him. Like, once he started speaking, I was like, oh, it's you, I, I recognize your voice. Yeah, that's uh, uh, Shia Wiggum's in there, he's just another FBI guy back at the, mm. the, the headquarters, the bureau. <laughs> Yep. I was going to say station, but they don't have stations, you know what I mean? Uh, the FBI office building. Uh, and that's pr- 
pretty much everyone notable. Justin Lin's back directing. He did the last mm -hmm. one as well. And obviously, as we've said last review, Han, uh, he only had like maybe six lines in this whole movie, but I loved him. He was great. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, but his last line of "I'm going to go check out Tokyo" was a bit on the no like. I just it felt like did, oh, you yeah. did you have to really like put a big neon sign? Honestly, saying I think they did because if they didn't do that, there were going to be people leaving the audience like, "But wait a minute, I just watched the last movie and he's not alive no more. How he show up here?" Mm, I don't know. It was, it was a bit too on the nose for me and my cool. taste, but. Yeah, so spoiler warning for Fast and Furious 4, uh, which is what I'm going to call it forever now, so just That's uh, fair. accept that. Um, it was Letty! It was Letty! That's your spoiler. It was Letty. It was Letty what? It was Letty. She's dead. She exploded. <laughs> no, she's not! <laughs> I can but tell you. <laughs> I can tell you for a fact that she ain't. <laughs> Letty is dead because Michelle Rodriguez was hitting it big and they weren't sure if she was going to be able to stay signed on for the rest of these movies. Wait, you think in 2009 they thought she was going to be too big to come back? I think so. Didn't she already have, like, a bunch of stuff under her belt? She was doing Avatar. Okay, sure, but, like... I, I wouldn't say her career was at, at that stage that it was, like... I don't know. I don't know about I, that. I, I think that they saw she was getting big and they realized we might not be able to keep I her I don't around. think she was getting big at this point. I, I, I mean, yeah, right. she was an Avatar technically, yes, that is true. But mm -hmm. I feel like she was also already in some Uva Bowl movies by this point. I well, she was, yes. I, I think this is more, they think that she's expendable and that no one's going to care if they if she's killed off. And then later on they change their minds because it's all about family and everyone has to be in the family. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> like, that, that, that's why. I, but yeah, see, because it doesn't even, you don't even see it. You just, it, Dom gets a phone call, Letty's been murdered. And I went, what? What? <laughs> I gotta say, in the way of plot setups, that has to be the strongest, I think. Like, that's the most out the gate, like, all right, we're going. We're not going to pause for nothing. Oh, jeez. All right. But we don't start with that. We start with uh, yes. the Dom and Letty are up to their old tricks. They're doing heists on moving vehicles with a three or four car team. Yep. Which, in this case, uh, I've never seen this before, so I don't know if this is something they made up for the movie, but a an oil or fuel tanker that has mm -hmm. multiple tanks daisy chained like a train car. Okay. It is a thing. Okay. However, I'll, I'll I have <laughs> I've never seen it on an oil tanker. Okay. I've seen it I've seen it on American roads with um like package delivery stuff. Like there I've seen UPS trucks just kind of daisy chained together. But I've oh, never no, yeah, seen it. No, I, I have seen that. I have seen okay. that. But that, that's that's a bit more like uh like the luggage cars at an airport almost yeah right uh but this is like the oil tanker but like there's like four of them all daisy chained together and the plan is to unhook the, the tankers at the back to sell the fuel for profit that's what they're into mm -hmm. uh on this job and i'll be honest i my my thoughts throughout this scene uh where they obviously get into some danger and eventually the tankers are like rolling around and blowing up and Dom, mm. literally, the big climax of the scene is that Dom has to drive under a bouncing tanker that is tanking down the road. Um, oh, I love it. So it just, it, you know, he drives it just the right second so that it'll go over the top of the car before it lands on the road again. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous, right? Over the top. Oh, absolutely. And that's fine. Um, I was thinking, though, that once they start to get into trouble, is all I could think was, this is your fault. You're idiots. You're unhooking oil tankers and are like oh no they've caught on fire and but things have went poorly here's the thing <laughs> if things went poorly just on their own yes i would agree however things went poorly because the driver decided to look out his mirror at some point which i think elevates that to a special level of stupid where if your entire <laughs> plan revolved around him not looking in his rear view mirror at any point it seems like a poor plan yeah uh i they, they i don't know they came off like idiots they could pull off cool moves sure but they still came off as yeah. idiots to me in this scene 
I mean, I I liked the scene. I liked the action in it. I think it was a fun, like, basically eye catch is the best way I could describe it. Of just, hey, we know you're sitting down wanting an action movie. We're going to give it to you in the first 10 minutes. Because everything that follows that for maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes is just setting up the story, getting all the pieces where they need to be. No action whatsoever. Mm. I, I, I thought, um, and this is probably just because some time had passed and they felt that all oh, the decisions they'd made in the first movie were probably quite stupid and dated by this point, so they weren't going mm. to. But I thought Michelle Rodriguez, for the little of her we get in the movie, she felt more just like Michelle Rodriguez here rather than the character that was in the first Fast and the Furious. And oh, yeah. I mean that, like, if you remember the first time you saw her in the first movie, she had these ridiculous big early 2000s, like, trainers or sneakers on. She had the baggy trousers and she had those, like, sunglasses on that were kind of, like, halfway down her nose. Like, she had this very specific, like, 2001 look. And I feel, yeah. as soon as we see her here and the way she talks to Dom, it just, like, oh, you just sound like you're, you're just Michelle Rodriguez now, where she had a very specific way of talking in that first movie. Like, not not even just talking. She's wearing, like, a full tactical getup. Yeah. And I think she has to have, like, a liquid nitrogen tank in order to freeze these locks on the oil tanker. It just... It feels like any one of her military characters from any one of those prior movies. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and obviously she practically was, but it does make the version of her in the first movie look more like a child, <laughs> effectively, mm -hmm. in comparison. Yeah. Um, so, which is not a complaint, it's just an observation uh, of how mm -hmm. different she feels. Uh, whereas Vin Diesel feels like he's barely aged because... Has Vin Diesel aged? Like, really? He looks a bit older now. I, I think you can sort of see it and hear it in his voice now. I mean, he seems, I don't want to say calmer because he's very still angry throughout the movie, but I always think back to that scene in the first movie where he's chewing out his friends for not bailing him out mm. of like the trouble he was in. And that oh, felt yes. like very loud, very angry, whatever. I never feel like we got to that level in this. Even at his emotional peak in this movie, it still felt like he was just Vin Dieseling it. Yeah. That's what I, I just meant he didn't look. Or I, I just meant he didn't look he'd aged that much in the, like from like a real life oh, yeah. sense. <laughs> Not so much the character, who I guess yeah, yeah he's calmed down a bit, I guess. Uh yeah, um so yeah, they they have this big action set piece and uh Han's gonna leave because this is you know, the cops have been after Dom, this is uh gonna draw their attention this big <laughs> yeah, no shit, this big tanker explosion <laughs> and everything else. Um which, oh, but, but on this subject as well, so the, t the, t the driver, like, dove out the vehicle when he realized they were coming up to this turn mm -hmm. on the edge of this mountain. And I'm like, this was the road that he was driving on anyway. And I get that maybe he's concerned that right. he can't slow down, but part of me was like, weren't you always going to have to make this turn? Yeah, I think it is one of those things that they specifically show, sorry, I have something in my eye. Uh, they specifically show um, that the road is at a very steep angle going downwards mm -hmm. and i think it is a thing where if he you know had the time had the ability to pump the brakes the whole way down that hill it would have been fine and he could have made the turn but he was forced to go full throttle the whole way down mm. okay. and as such there's no chance he would have been able to break on that, that that is completely fair enough but it was just it was the thought that immediately came out in my head uh, oh yeah but i was was like but you were going to make that turn anyway i don't i don't think they could have did a good job of forecasting that of showing yeah. that to the audience but with a little bit of reasoning out i think that it makes sense yeah uh it's funny like like they're, they're, they're lucky the driver jumped out in a way because otherwise like like they come off as idiots but they'd be really unsympathetic if that driver got killed and all this because he's oh, pretty, yeah he's probably innocent it's the, <laughs> he's, he's just doing his job driving his tiger I mean, I mean that's the thing with any of the crimes they did even in the first movie if anyone ended up actually dying from it immediately they're just villains it's only because they're stealing from you know nameless corporations and it's like ah oh, oh, we're robin hooding it panasonic is not nameless that's true those vcr combos must still be going for millions <laughs> it's a lucrative opportunity David. how how funny would it have been in this opening if they were still stealing the tv vcr combos and they were like trying to sell them afterwards, and they got like two dollars fifty cents a pop. <laughs> and someone just walked out because it's two thousand nine. Someone's got some Blu-rays in their hand, like 
Yeah, no, exactly. No, I'm not. I'm not watching a VCR. Get like no one's gonna me. buy this. Why are you still stealing them? <laughs> the sport of it. <laughs> Why is the truck driver protecting them with his life? I don't know. He's he's passionate about his yeah <laughs> about his products. You don't mess with a truck driver's truck. Um. So, but the big thing is the hands leaving off to go to Tokyo because the heat's on and mm. Dom's feeling the heat and he wants to kind of leave Letty because he feels like if he gets caught she's going to get as just as much trouble as him when it's really not her that's behind everything it's him so he right. wants to kind of bail she says no and they, they seem to have sex but then he like leaves in the night and he can kind of see this coming he's, he's going to leave without her knowing and he leaves some cash behind for her and just goes so that he'll you know to protect her you know he's been the, right. the noble uh thief if you will mm. and then we cut ahead we cut ahead to uh brian and his suit chasing down a criminal uh we get a rooftop chase they're running through alleyways and you know i don't have really much to say about it but it, this is all just feeding into the, whoever they're looking for who ends up being the main big bad of the of the movie yes uh, and dom gets a phone call from mia the sister saying that letty has been murdered and I laughed hysterically because I'm like, what are you talking about? She's in like four of the movies after this, at yeah. least. Uh, so, yeah, I, it, it, all this is, and it, it, it gets to the point where like, you know, Dom comes back and he watches the funeral from a distance. Brian and the FBI are all there thinking he's going to show up. Uh, mm. Like, so it's all very weird and like emotionally fueled. And Brian's like, oh, I love Dom and I love his sister. Uh, uh, but i love dom <laughs> so i want i want dom to show up but i don't want him to get arrested so i have you know he's, he's conflicted about everything this is all going on mm -hmm. and at least in a scene where dom goes to his sister and he's like take me to the crash site and i feel like before this they never actually mentioned that the murder involved a crash site that i that felt no like, they did not yeah this was new information to me but it seemed like yeah she was crashed into in pursuit and then seemingly shot afterwards that seems to mm -hmm. be what's happened but we get this scene where Dom, because it's car related, is suddenly Sherlock Holmes and envisions the the crime as it happened. The crime I'm, scene. <laughs> I'm glad you're calling it a Sherlock Holmes as well, because I was just That's, waiting for like the text to pop I up know. on screen of him like listing through fuel types it, and him being like, "Ah, oh, this must have been a this must have been a double charged V8 engine with Continental tires." It's like, okay, Dom, whatever you say, buddy. There's some residue on the ground, and he suddenly, oh, yep. this, must, this must come from this fuel source. And then he, then he envisions the car like tumbling down the road, sort of past them, and uh, I, I got you know a good chuckle it, out of this. I I want there to be one of those procedural shows that is on every single one of the network channels, but it's just Vin Diesel and car crimes, and um, he just always has this pop up. I'm trying to think of a pun. Oh, okay. PSI. No. I mean, his last name is Diesel. That's got to. <laughs> it's got to be right there. Uh, um. Uh. By the way, just wanted to throw this out before I forget about it. Um. Apparently, there was a short film, 18 minutes long, directed by Vin Diesel, that bridges the gap between what happened to Dom at the end of the first movie and how we ended up in the oh. fourth movie. Okay. So just reading a basic plot synopsis here, he was hiding out in Mexico. He met up with two of the guys who were on his crew and he then calls up Han. They get to Dominican Republic and then Letty shows up as well. That sounds like shit. That sounds like these are the characters that are there at the start of the fourth. We're going to literally just show him saying, hey, I, I want you to do something with me. That, that's, yeah. that's, that sounds like shared universe, just like ticking the boxes nonsense to me. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so yes, uh, so he's doing his crime scene investigation, <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, I know who sells this type of fuel," and he goes after him and threatens him at the the garage. And it turns out the person, the name he gets from this guy that he beats up a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. is the same guy that Brian's looking for through the FBI. So the plots yes. are. So I will say this for it: mm -hmm. the idea that both of them are actually after the same person, and that it's like building to a crossover point where they're going to like run into each other mm -hmm. i think that's actually quite a smart idea for the structure yeah I, th I think it does a great job of setting all that up because it's not like they're 
crossing over at the main villain because obviously the main villain wouldn't be the one who did this to Letty. It would just be yeah, some yeah. low-level no-name. It makes sense that they cross over at a much lower point down the totem pole of just getting information. And I mean, just to cover Brian's plot real quick, uh, we open up on him chasing a perp full-on parkour across rooftops through windows, multiple windows they crash through. And then he gets the name of David Park, which they figure is the guy who's basically hooking up people to race in order to get a spot on the big bad guy's driving team. Well, why is it with all these villains having races as additions for their, <laughs> for their Things drivers? need to get from point A to point B, and if you're going to do it, you're going to do it in style. Yeah, so basically they put Brian undercover to go mm. win this race, to get on the team. And they mention here, there's a little nugget for later, they mention that, that like they've had like three previous undercover people go in and all of them have turned up dead. Right, yeah. that's a little little tidbit for later. Mm -hmm. So Brian's like, yeah, I get a race a car. He's like picking his car from the impound and all that stuff, and he's all he's all into it. Um, no, he not only does he pick a car, he is listed off a bunch of cars, and he says which one, and he says all of them. And, and I then think, we get the whole soup up scene. Yeah, which which uh, edits with uh, Dom getting his car ready as well. It cuts back and forth mm -hmm. between them because they're equals. You see, yep. they're equals and. Specifically, it's his dad's car that he crashed in the first movie. Yes. Apparently, Mia saved it. And Letty was working on it before she died. Yes. Just to explain, we know that car is now iconic and is with Dom no matter what. So we had to somehow bring it back. Yeah, but a car you can bring back from the dead. I'll, I'll, I can accept that. And a Letty. And like seven other people, apparently. <laughs> Yeah, actually, somewhere, I think it's around here before we get to this this race, we'll just mention, mention it before we go too far. Mm -hmm. um, they're, like, Mia's brought in for questioning because they think Dom's around, and mm -hmm. Brian, like, comes and gets her and's like, hey, let's go talk, and takes her to, you know, a diner or something, and basically she's just kind of pissed at him, you lied to us, you know, you pretended to love me, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's kind of just a, a dull, annoying scene, to be honest. But my favorite part yeah. that comes out of this is that Shia Wiggum's like this other FBI agent who doesn't like Brian very much. And mm. I think he, there's a scene that starts with Brian walking into this, the, 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 the bureau and Shia Wiggum out of nowhere just runs up and says, how dare you, and starts trying to fight him. And I think he's mad because Brian took me away, but I, I'm not yes. entirely sure, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, that's why. Is that yeah. why? Okay. He's, he screams out, if you ever release one of my witnesses again. Right. And starts throwing punches. Brian reverses the first punch he throws and whacks his head into the wall. So he effectively, in one shot, has beaten the piss out of Shia Wiggum. Which, oh, absolutely. Which is a shame, because he's a much better actor, but it was a an amusing moment for him to just get his ass handed to him that quickly. Oh, uh, yeah. It did give me a chuckle, even though it's the movie trying to convince us that Brian is cool and a badass, and I'm not having that movie. I'm not even sure. I mean, yes, it was trying to do that, but I think it was more so trying, because the uh, character's name is Stasiak. It was trying to convince mm. us that that guy is just the butt monkey, where nothing he does at any point in this movie will be the right call. I would go as far as to say his character probably has no value in the movie, which is a shame, because I do like Shia Wiggum as an actor, but yeah. you could cut him out and nothing would change. Like The only thing that would change is kind of like the big showdown towards the end, but not even by that much. You could easily no. write around that. I, I feel like you could have just had the guy in charge and any adversity that Shia Wiggum interjects, you could have just mm. had come from him as well. It, oh, yeah. it, it, it would have worked just the same. But yeah, so we get to this race where Brian and Dom are both there and like... Well, Dom, on, we, we oh? skipped over the scene where Dom is dangling the dude out the window. Oh, of course. At the crossover yes, yes, point. Yes, 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 this is where they first interact. You're right, you're right. Yep. Uh, so... Yeah, so Brian's like, okay, let me go check out this guy whose name we got. Dom's already there, beating him up, dangling him at the window. And this is sort of the first time they run into each other. And it's, mm. you know, it's clearly established for both of them that Brian's with the FBI. He's looking into the people who are behind Letty's death, because uh, mm -hmm. they were already tied to his case anyway. And Dom's like, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. <laughs> right? That's, that's basically what this sets I'm up. I'm not a violent man anymore, but I'm going to kill them all. Effectively, what this sets up though is that when we get to the race audition, right? And there's, I, I, because it's Fast and the Furious, there's a bunch of, you know, 
women who are dressed with very little clothing, dancing, yeah. make it out with each other. It's a whole thing. And we get this idea that Brian's there undercover. Dom pretty much knows that because he's like, well, why else would he be here? He's clearly here on, on work. And mm-hmm. Brian knows why Dom's here. So they're both kind of like racing for this position so they can get closer to the bad guy uh, for their own reasons. So mm-hmm. there, there's kind of like a dick measuring contest, but it kind of works in the plot as well. So oh yeah, um, for for me the movie, I, I think I kind of like enough of this setup well enough. I think it's structurally sound the way it brings them both together, and that they've got this personal thing inside, like the plot that also makes sense with going to the bad guy. I think it's mm-hmm. after this where they're both like you know taken for the job, where it kind of just fizzles, and I don't really like much of what happens after that. Yeah, that's what when I was saying at the beginning, I had some structural problems with this movie. It's none of this. All the stuff with them making the reasons as to why they get into this race and trying to do that makes perfect sense to me. I think it's very well written the way they do it. It's only, I would say, once they're called out for the first job that it starts kind of being a bit haphazard, a bit of we just need to have this scene happen. It doesn't matter how we get there. Yeah, momentum-wise, it starts to feel like it's meandering a bit. Where yeah. Because nothing feels like... I don't know, like there's, there's not like a clear A to B to C to D. It kind of feels a little bit like it's waffling in between the letters. Even though it's, it's never slow, don't get me wrong. It's never no, taking no. too long. If anything, it feels kind of meaningless because we're just going through things too quickly. But yeah, you get this big race. This is the one with the sat-nav or the, the uh, what do you call it, GPS voice and all that stuff. Yeah and it's just kind of whatever the big thing is that the others in the race obviously don't have a chance i thought what they were going to do to get both of them on the on the job because it's only one position that's open i thought they were going to tie oh same yeah i thought because you know because they 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 mirrored that moment with the first movie where brian pressed the 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 nos button too quickly and dom's like too quick you know young kid and then he won they flip it here where dom presses the button too quickly and then Brian's like, too quick, Dom. And he, he's taking out the lead. And then Dom wins by just ramming him and knocking him off the road <laughs> and basically cheating. Uh, I which... mean, you say that, but the entirety of the race was just them ramming each other into, like, other cars of traffic. So... Yeah, that that's true. But Brian says that he cheated for the rest of oh, the yeah. movie. Well, he that, did. That's his Absolutely. stance. <laughs> so that, you know, that, that wraps that up. And it's like, okay, there's some mm-hmm. personal stakes here that have some history. That's all fine. Uh, mm-hmm. Brian gets on by basically arresting one of the other guys who was already on the driving squad for the bad guy. Uh, this wacky little side character, thank you, who yeah. we have to mention. He's only really got two moments. There's the moment where Brian first arrives at the race and he's standing there with three women uh, on his arm, and mm-hmm. he's basically just I don't know yelling things at Brian. And I don't. He has some sort of accent going on that I don't. I don't know where it's from. It sounded, it's, yeah, it sounded like a sort of southern, but... But, like, nowhere identifiable. It yeah. sounded like deep Alabama, I guess, would be where I would put it at. But his name is Papa Dwight. And he <laughs> refers to himself as Papa Dwight. Yes. What, what, what I don't get is that he's got a really ridiculous hairstyle, and he just looks kind of weird. It, it, mm-hmm. it, it's like some dweeb is trying to go for, like, heck vanilla ice or something. I, I, I don't know what else to call it. Yeah, but nah. For some reason, this man is such a hit with the ladies that when we cut to his place after the race, like the next morning or whatever it is, mm-hmm. he's got five women with him. Two of them are making out in the background. The other three are making out on the couch. And he just asks one of them to take their shoe off so he can, so he can suck her toes. Which he yep. does. You know, yep. he's having, you know, what's, what's, what's the opposite of a gangbang? <laughs> I mean, he's just a voyeur in this situation, I guess, is the opposite. He's, he's sucking toes. He's, he's, yeah. he's, he's getting in there. He's like barely involved, though. Um, just looked up this actor. Apparently, he has been the voice of Beast Boy and Michelangelo in all Teen Titans and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle shows, respectively. Fair enough. <laughs> I suspect I'm sure Nickelodeon hired him specifically because of this role. <laughs> I suspect the voice he does in those are a little different to uh, what he does in this movie. Eh, I don't know, man. Teen Titans got weird at the end. <laughs> 
Yeah, but Bri- Brian basically frames him just so that he's out of commission for a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, which, I don't know, felt a little bit like... I, I, I'm not going to root for someone planting evidence, even if it's for a good reason. Like, I'm not even caring about that. The entire Dom side of the plot, of how he got into all this, it felt very well structured. I always felt like Brian on the FBI side was kind of just deus exing their way the whole way through. Like, Brian mm. just happened to stumble across Dom as he was doing this. The F- He managed to get Mia out because he was just sitting in the right room at the right time. And as we'll see later on, it's just little things that just so happen to go right for Brian's side. It doesn't feel like he ever earned any of the stuff he's doing. He just forces the yeah, okay, system yeah. to give it to him. Yeah, I think it's it just... It's one of those things where he just kind of laughs it off, says, yeah, that will keep him, but it's all right. He just has to be out for a little while. Like, shrug. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I guess I, I wouldn't really care that much if it was like, oh, some awful murderer, but they, like, planted drugs to, like, take him in to get him off the streets. I'd be like, okay, I can kind of, like, vibe with that to a point. But right. I just kind of felt like, but he's innocent of this. Yeah. I mean, if I had to <laughs> assume what it would be is that the FBI would say, hey, look, we're arresting this guy for a different case we'll keep him in jail for a while, but the DA is not going to press any charges. Yeah, like, I don't that's know. That's probably just, what it would end up being. It's just the way the moment plays it where he just kind of smiles and laughs it off like, ha, lol, that'll keep a bit of trouble for a little while. I'm like, no. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> as the series progresses, I'm pretty sure we're supposed to relate less and less with the law enforcement agency, so get used to that. But that's my problem, though. This is this this feels realistic to me. I I, I don't trust the law oh, yeah. enforcement not to do shit like this. Yeah, exactly. It's a cautionary tale. Not in this moment, it's not. <laughs> You're meant to be rooting for him. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, in that case. Oh bloody hell! All right, so. I don't know. I really related to Papa Dwight. That was <sighs> that was my audience oh, stand. <laughs> so. Yeah, they get so my 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 memory is gonna get hazy here about what job came, or what part of the jobs came first, but the the next thing was the bar. Oh yeah, they, they were at the bar, hang out with the uh, uh, with the uh, Campos played by Jar Ortiz. Which, by the mm-hmm. way, this was the scene where they kept asking for the main guy Braga, and he's like, oh, he doesn't show himself off. And this was the moment where I went, "You're really Raz Al Ghul, aren't you?" <laughs> I mean, I I think maybe it's just because I'm not as wrapped up in it. I didn't immediately get that, but there were definitely. But when it got to the later point, when um, what was it? Um, Brian, he's he goes upstairs in the bar. He follows Campos, and he sees him drinking with some guy, and he's like, "Oh, that guy must be the the guy. He must be Bragas." It was at that point where I was like, okay. So, I mean, clearly it's not going to be the guy we're seeing because we're seeing his entire face at this point and this movie is playing it off to be a mystery. But I still am not quite sure who it is. So you got one up on me. It, it just it was one of those things that just clicked right away for me. And then every single time they mentioned about trying to see Braga or can we meet Braga? And he's like, oh, he doesn't come out for thing. I was like, it's sure. It's, the whole time I'm like, it's you, you dipshit. That's fair. Uh, so I would have loved for it to be Gal Gadot after everything's said and done. <laughs> yeah, well, it's around here. She tries to flirt with Dom a little bit, um, mm-hmm. and when she catches him on on his own here, because he's sort of snuck down into the garage, and she's saying, "Hey, you're not one of these guys who likes cars more than women, do you?" And that's where the, your quote from the start of the episode came from. Yes, it was. Uh, this is also the scene where she's very clearly not wearing a bra. Um, yes, it is. I couldn't help but notice. Uh, it just it's like beacons in the night. I, I mean, they're not trying to hide it. It's no. not a, it's not a secret. But she basically starts trying to flirt with him, and he describes his perfect woman and describes Letty, <laughs> like mm. just describes her, and she's like, that "Doesn't sound like me at all." And he's like, "It's not," and walks out. It's actually really yeah. quite cold, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, I actually appreciate that. Of they, they explicitly show another woman interested in the Dom and. He is still not over Letty because in the first movie, there was kind of this weird flirting thing where Mm -hmm. he was flirting with other girls despite Letty being there. But this movie just really buckles down and says like, no, he truly did love her. That was a serious relationship they had, regardless of whatever he was doing 
in the meantime. No, I mean, this is actually more interesting that he does, like, it, it, it's the sort of thing I'd expect them to do, is have him just immediately shack up with someone else, and, like, mm-hmm. we'd sort of complain, no, this is kind of stupid, he, like, she literally just died, you know, he just came back because of her funeral. Yeah. Uh, it would be very weird for him to be even remotely in the mood for anything like that. So mm. that was a, a decision that made sense. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'll give credit where credit is due. Uh, but so they're, they're, they show up in their cars, right, for the next proper thing. And yep. they drive to a place and they're... Okay, actually, sorry. Oh. We skipped over a tiny little bit here and it actually pissed me off, like, oh. a lot. Oh, okay, okay. What we got? So we have them we have brian go into the fbi building to provide fingerprints to be run and they say oh it's going to take like weeks it's going to take forever to run it and he's like all right get started and then his gps thing goes off saying hey get ready we have a job for you just gonna throw out there he brought his gps device into an fbi headquarters (laughs) I think that's poor planning. Hmm. Spe- yeah, especially if someone's uh, tracking that bad boy. Uh, the whole point of a GPS device is to track it. I feel like this is the worst thing he could have done. Yeah. Um, no, that's a good point. They, do, they had like a line, though, to explain why it was going to take so long for the fingerprints. Because the fingerprints eventually are what reveals who uh, Braga really is, right? Eventually mm-hmm. reveals who the villain actually is. Um, they mentioned, like, oh, they have to check it with, like, I don't know if it was Mexico or somewhere else, but, like, oh, they have to manually check for all the fingerprint matches. That, not, like, yeah. our superior American computer system. <laughs> what, are they wanted Windows 95 down there? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I was like, hey, all right. <laughs> there, there is one point, and we'll get to it at the end, when the fingerprints do come back, and they explicitly are showing, like, the printout coming out of a fax machine. The name that's associated with the fingerprints that they are getting faxed over is Braga. It says Braga on the thing. So could they not have sped up their search significantly by just looking through these systems for Braga? <laughs> maybe yeah, maybe start with some lately suspects first, and then if you get no hits there, yeah. then you can open it up for everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I feel like they were searching through like male and female, all races, all countries, and they probably could have limited it down by just saying, "Oh, and by the name, way the name is Braga." Oh, hey, two hours later, here's our hit. If that, come on. <laughs> yeah. How many Bragas are there? A few dozen, yeah. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I don't know that those two things, both of them revolving around the fingerprints to some extent, really pissed me off, and that's why I think the the FBI plot is the worst structured out of this because they're always just kind of not deserving the things they're getting. Anywho, uh, they go for the job, and Brian shuts the brick for a second because they're checking for tracking devices, which there is mm-hmm. one in his car because they made him use it. And it's basically just a, a thing to make them suspect that, oh, Brian's turned. Brian's turned on us because he's turned off his tracking device. Yeah. No one Didn't cares. they do that in the second one? Wasn't that a thing? Well, they, like... thought they, they thought that he was running because of... Right. The, yeah, that's what yeah. it was. Yeah. Uh, even though he was just doing the test that the villain wanted him to do, which was the, you know, the entire point was to gain his trust, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, You'd think maybe the FBI, he would tell his in- superior officers, by the way, if my tracker does anything weird, just know... I'm doing something that's required for this job. Mm-hmm. Yep. So they end up getting put into a truck. All the cars. like So they, they, both Brian and Dom plus the other guys get put in a truck. And then we end up going to Mexico via hidden tunnels in some mountains, which have got a fake entrance and exit so it looks like it's just the mountain but it's actually, you know, a bit of it's like a wooden door that's painted to look like the rest of the mountain. This was my first note that was in all caps of just hidden effing tunnels, LOL. Looney Tunes shit, that's what this yeah, was. Yeah, pretty is... much. They pre- It's a bat cave. He presses the button, it goes up, they drive in, it goes down. It's it's a bat cave. Yes. So, uh, and what's interesting is it does take a bit of a swerve here because as soon as Phoenix is there, which is the guy mm-hmm. who seemingly is the who killed Letty, as soon as it's confirmed he's there, Dom immediately just drops the act, doesn't pretend that he's going to do the job and take the the, yeah. the, the cargo to wherever it's going to go. 
he just says you know he brings up letty implies he's going to kill him and he's already like set his car to explode which sets a chain reaction to explode all of the cars that are next to yeah. it <laughs> so we get a big boom and then you know gunfighting breaks out but brian and dom end up driving away with all of the drugs that they were going to be transporting so they've got like a bargaining chip uh, mm-hmm. and brian and i'm pretty sure this is breaking a couple of rules refuses to give it to the fbi and says no no no, let's not let's not use this yet because we can use this as a bargaining chip i'm like yeah but you still have to give it to your superior you still they still have to know where it is this is <laughs> yeah he he walks into the office everybody's eyeing him down he sits down and they're like well what have you got what have you got for us and he's like oh well i've got the drugs and they ask where is it and he says safe and i'm like cool you're fired man <laughs> yeah. this is this is not protocol <laughs> Nothing. You are you are going to be put into a black room and you are going to lose some fingernails until they get the location of sixty million dollars worth of drugs. And they have the was... the ironic touch of him hiding them in an impound lot. He uses yes. his badge to get into an impound lot and hides the car. Because there. that's the last place that... and I love the little conversation he has with Dom here of hey, you blew up my car. That means you owe me a ten second car. And then Dom just breaks into another car in the impound lot, says, There you go. Yeah, wouldn't the guy at the front who let him in think, where did you get that other car from that you're driving out And You'd think so, but we didn't have that scene. Yeah, yeah, they just cut past it, so we didn't, we yep. didn't know how that played out, but okay. Uh, one thing worth noting is that during all the scuffle, during the cars exploding and whatnot, Dom was actually shot, and he just oh. tanks it. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's shot in the back of the shoulder, and he just like he, it's like there's a slight flinch, a just the slightest. I, I didn't even see the slight flinch. All I saw was shot in the shoulder, and he looks over at his other shoulder at who shot him, in the most menacing, like Riddick way. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, so they're they're laying low. They end up with Mia, who brings them like supplies and stuff, and she's patching mm-hmm. up Dom's shoulder and yada yada. Uh, they had and, dinner. Always important to have dinner. They have there the three of them, so this is like mini family stuff. It's only the three of them, so it's not full family, but it's a bit of family. Yeah. And it, it this leads up to the big reveal, though. Uh, when when Dom gets his hands on Letty's phone and realizes that one of the numbers that's been calling it were Brian, he realizes that Letty, when she was working for the bad guy and it ended up dead, she was working for Brian in the FBI. Yeah. And Dom flies off the handle, starts beating the shit out of Brian. Brian, you know, is barely helping himself fight back and yells out eventually that Letty chose to do this. She wasn't forced into it. She offered to do it because she wanted to win Dom's freedom. She was yeah. trying to win uh, immunity for him. And that makes Dom stop. Which I, gets all... I don't think that's how that works. I don't think you can put yourself in as champion of some other person to <laughs> yeah, get immunity I, but I, I don't think like obviously this idea of like making deals you know by giving up names and things to get a lesser mm-hmm. sentence or immunity like there is some truth in that but yeah. we're at the point in this franchise where they literally like even later on brian says like we'll use the we'll use those drugs that we took from the bad guys to to get the main guy braga but in return you let dom go like why would they agree to this? You're meant to be working with them. You may be part that's, of the FBI. That's not even later in the movie. That's at the point where he refuses to tell them where the drugs are. <laughs> He's like, I'll, make, I'll make a deal for my lover. I mean, best friend, Dom Toretto. <laughs> Please, let him I go. Feel like, I feel like it's a poker scene and Brian went in there thinking he had like a royal flush and meanwhile he had like <laughs> a single pair just... and a Uno card. You can't just walk, in, especially when you work there. You can't just walk into the FBI and go, "Look, I'll help you. I'll do my job and help you take this bad guy down." But in return, you have to let this other guy go because I like. I him. have access to classified <laughs> materials. I am withholding sixty million dollars of drugs for you, and I would like a criminal to go free. Any questions? And it's not even like they're backed into a corner where it's like they're not. <laughs> You know, it's, it's not like they're on a timer to get this guy. It's not like it's so just if you want to catch him now, we could probably do it and you can let Dom go. <laughs> and that was the other thing is that his superiors were like, we just want to take the drugs and show that we made a good bust. We don't like when we get him, we get him. And it was only <laughs> when Brian pushed back. I'm like, but we can get him now. <laughs> That's the only thing that changed their minds. 
Oh dear. Uh, obviously, Dom and Brian will uh, get closer as the movie goes on after this because mm-hmm. they end up saving each other, working together. It's worth mentioning that during the, the gunfight, Gal Gadot was about to be hit by one of the cars and Dom pulled her out the way. Yeah. Uh, so she ends up being kind of an ally who gives him some intel later to where to find Braga. Uh, but that's the, that's after the first meet-up with, with him, though. Because we mm-hmm. get the meet-up where we actually find out who Braga really is, and it just turns out to be John Ortiz's character, Campos. Um, yeah, I, I really disliked this scene just because there was the whole thing was that, okay, nobody move until Brian gives the signal that Braga's is definitely here. Mm-hmm. And then the fingerprint thing just happens to come back at this point. And the woman who was staying back at the office tells the group of FBI agents like, hey, we just got fingerprint confirmation. It's definitely Braga's. And so Stasiak, noted butt monkey, decides everyone run in now. And it's only after that point that we get the reveal, as the audience at least, that the old guy who showed up wasn't actually Braga's. And the only reason I don't like this scene is that the moment that he says everyone in there now, you know he's not Braga's. And yet, after a minute more of setting it up, then they do the reveal. I felt like that was too far out broadcasted. Yeah, I think the movie's kind of weird at this point because Dom played his hand already as to what mm-hmm. he was up to. And I, I guess in a way it was a smart choice just to differentiate it from two. Because if he kept playing along and him and Brian were undercover for more of the movie, it might feel too much like two. So yeah. this was maybe an effort to go, no, Dom's not going to have the patience for that. Like he he just, it, it took his swing and his chance when he could so mm-hmm. they try and make this deal where they're going to give this stuff back and meet up and they want to see Braga that's the condition they want to meet uh, Braga and then the, the shootout commences and he gets away of course and whatever else and it's after this where you know Brian's understandably because like they failed to get the bad guy and whatnot is taken Dom also off the, escaped yeah he's yeah. taken off the force so you're not having that uh, so Brian just goes to Dom and says, I'll go with you. Well, let's go take out Braga. And Dom's like, I'm not bringing him back. And he's like, I know. We're going to go kill him. Let's go do it. We're uh, going to go full Thelma and Louise on this one. Although Dom does actually, when they get Braga, he does agree. He just like, no, you can arrest him and take him back. But Phoenix, the one that actually killed Letty, like, I'm killing him. And Brian's mm-hmm. like, yep, that's fine. <laughs> I couldn't care less. Do what you got to do, man. <laughs> do what you do. Yep. Uh, so they go and find him. He's like hiding in a church in Mexico. You know, he's hiding out. So I looked away for like 30 seconds here <laughs> and all of a sudden we were in a church in Mexico and I had no idea how we got here. Yeah. They got his location from Gal Gadot who's helping them because, you know, Dom saved their life and now she's kind yep. of like on the good guy side. Uh, and she is in more movies so I guess it makes sense that, you know, they win her over here. So... They show up, they get they get Braga, uh, they, they grab, put him in the car. D- well, they d- give, at this point, they give Dom what I guess is his big emotional moment. Like, this is the peak of his storyline of he holds the shotgun to Braga's head mm-hmm. and is about to pull the trigger. And they hold on that for like a minute and a half until finally he's like, no, we're going to put you through the legal system like you deserve. Okay. I don't, I never felt like... Dom was actually that angry at Braga the whole time. Yes, Braga was responsible for Letty's death and like he ordered it, but I always felt like he was more pissed off at Phoenix the entire time. Yeah, honestly, Dom's arc where at the end of the movie he's like, I'm not running anymore. I'm going to go and face the consequences for what I've done. I don't know if the movie really sets up that decision to me in any way. No, not really. It just He does it at the end because it's the good guy thing to do, but there's not really any build up to it. Uh, but they end up obviously in a car chase because it's a Fast and the Furious movie. Uh, what? Brian's got uh, Braga. Braga in his car. Uh, Dom's in his car as well, and you know he they're racing about. The, the so Phoenix is in a car. Some other bad guys in another car. So you got two good guy cars, two bad guy cars, and they're chasing across mm-hmm. the desert. They're going for the mountains, and you know. Brag is like, ah, you don't know what the tunnel is. You don't know what the tunnel is. And Brian's like, I, th- I think I do. I think I know what the tunnel is. So he drives through what looks like rock, but it's obviously it's just the wood. And it 
breaks and he drives through. So yep. we we actually get an extended chase sequence in these tunnels in the mountain where there's like no light, which is a poor choice. <laughs> I I appreciate what they were doing. They obviously set up that these tunnels were a thing before, but it looked like crap. Uh, yeah, they... I wasn't able to tell really who was where, what was going on. All I could establish is this car is still driving and another car has blown up. That's all I got out of it. Yeah, it's... um. There's like moments they make enough sense where I, I thought they were going to do like a cave-in thing because they kept hitting the beams mm -hmm. that were holding up this tunnel. But, you know, it, it, nothing really came of it. I think Dom at one point intentionally like sort of spun his car around so the other car would hit into him. Yeah. There were some moments like that. But it, it, yeah, like, it's almost like, okay, the idea of these tunnels is silly enough to feel like it's from the rest of this franchise. But you can't see enough of it to really get the spectacle that's going to be coming from the rest of this right. franchise. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the same issue that we ran into, as we said. In the first movie, they held that last heist during the day so you could see it, so you could pick up on all the choreography and cool stuff. They l forgot that lesson by the time they got here. They did, forgot that, oh, wait, we need large panning shots. We need lights. We need the ability to tell who's where in order for people to appreciate what's going on. Yeah, but... It's, uh, oddly, it's kind of similar to the problems we had with the final chase of the last movie as well, which is, mm -hmm. you know, it was set in night, and it wasn't in tunnels, but it was still too dark to really see much of anything. It was mostly right. just, you know, two dark cars kind of, like, banging into each other over and over mm -hmm. again. There wasn't much to really, like, give you build up to the moments or whatever. Once it gets out the other end of the tunnel, is a bit more of a set piece uh, where yes. Phoenix is there, and he's going to kill Brian who's kind of hurt at this point because uh, the car flipped over when they got out. Uh, but Dom comes speeding out the tunnel. Brian holds Phoenix's leg so that he can't move, and Dom rams into him and sandwiches him into the other car. It's such a little moment of Brian holding his leg. Like, it's only one shot that we show it's yes. happening, but it, so, it sells the entire thing of like, nah, bro, you're going to die. I made, a, <laughs> I made a pact with my friend here. You ain't getting out of this one. Yeah, and uh, you know, Dom, I think, cracks a little joke with Brian uh, mm -hmm. as he's sitting there helping him, and they hear the sirens, and Brian's like, you gotta go, and he's like, nah, I'm not running anymore. So we get this ending where Dom is like, the, the judge to Dom in his hearings, like, you did help bring in this, you know, dangerous kingpin, and that's great, but you've done a lot of bad shit through your life, so you're still getting 25 20 to life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you get sent to prison, he's on a prison bus, and then the movie ends with, like, three black cars coming in, just like mm -hmm. the heist with the trucks in the first movie, just like the, the tanker heist at the start of this movie. And it's Brian, Mia, who I guess can drive well. I, I, the movies have never really told us that, I don't think, but sure. No, but it makes sense. Yeah. And then the two goons from the opening heist as well, who are there to help, like, break him out. And the movie just ends with, like, Vin Diesel smiling, like, oh, they're here for me. And it just cuts yeah. to the credits, like, you don't have to see it. You know what they're about to do. Fair mm -hmm. enough. Um, I, th I thought the third car was going to be Han just because he'd mean more to us. Here's the thing. It's actually really good that it wasn't Han because if it was, none of this would make sense anymore. Like, the, it, it, like I was saying at the beginning, if this was put in this spot between like the, you know, the first 10 minutes and then Tokyo Drift oh, sure. and the end of the movie happens, if they were to show Han again, yes, it would make sense from what we know the timeline actually is, but people walking out of the theater would be like, excuse me? Well, th that's that doesn't work at all. That's why I said I thought it may be him, though, is because I know he's going to be in more movies. So mm -hmm. I was thinking, oh, they're, they're, they, they'd already made that choice. But I don't think they had. I think that's a choice no. they made after this movie. <laughs> I think they didn't make that choice until they were like, we really, really want to keep using Han. How do we do it? Timey way me. Yeah. As it's going to turn out, in, in Fast and Furious 11... A time machine yeah, out of a DeLorean. No, we're They're going to find hit out. 88. We're going to find out there's been multiple timelines and they're all, they're all going to converge multiverse oh, style. Oh, God, the Fast and Furious multiverse. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, dear. So I wouldn't put it past it, honestly. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, that's the movie. I Yeah, honestly... I think the setup is solid enough for, like, given the fact that I don't care about these characters that much, I don't mm -hmm. care about their history, 
it uses what was at least established in the first movie well enough and i would argue this is the first movie that really feels like a true sequel to the first movie yes um absolutely it uses what that history is to build up to dom and brian crossing paths everything makes a reasonable amount of sense for them showing up and then being in that same race together and them having this personal rivalry as they're doing it but once they're actually undercover properly going after the bad guy um while i get that they wanted to try and differentiate it from two i feel like the decisions made to differentiate it instantly it started made the plot feel quite muddy and i wasn't really Mm -hmm. the momentum just felt kind of weird to me in the back half of the movie where i never really felt like i was i was super into what it was doing um i felt like especially with the fbi involvement i felt like we were bouncing back and forth and like it just it felt too weird that they were still even letting brian do anything at a certain point and once they did sort of like pull away from him or put him on ice and he just went with dom anyway it just kind of felt well did it matter then he could have just done this yeah. before i mean i feel exactly the same way as that i think the first i want to say act in general right up until and probably including that first race i really appreciate that i think it feels super solid the whole way through it builds up how these relationships were left at the end of the first movie and how they would naturally develop here five years later and then the whole middle of the movie who cares the whole middle of the movie feels redundant not needed and it's only once you get to the point where Brian is agreeing to go to Mexico with Dom again that I think it gets back into the group. Mind you, I also think the desert chase scene is kind of superfluous. I don't think it really had enough to it to sell it as a set piece, but yeah. it was there at the very least. Um, I think the problem is then, it's just a big flat open space. There's nothing yeah. to, you know. I think, I think the issue is, is that they really kept it low to the ground, gave it this feeling of being in the action whereas because it's a flat open space and it's a bunch of nearly identical cars it would have done better to give me more of an aerial view so i could get a feel for where is everybody who's chasing who how far away are they that sort of stuff um but what i really do want to bring up though is that last scene i feel that that last scene is the bridging point it is the moment where we are finally getting into what i've always heard and imagined the fast and furious franchise is we have all of these outlaws on the run doing these heists and whatnot in big bombastic ways i feel that's where we're finally making that bridging point imagine if five starts with uh, brian back at the fbi <laughs> i will actually cry <laughs> if, I, if i have to see this guy inside one of those buildings and here's the thing I imagine they are going to be back in the FBI. I imagine they're going to be contacted by agent Dwayne, the rock Johnson, <laughs> and he's going to show up and say, Hey, you guys are good drivers and we've got another heroin dealer. Oh, no, actually, Fine. I, I think that does happen kind of in like six ish, mm -hmm. but I think in five, the rocks hunting them. I think, cause the only thing I've not seen five, but the only thing I remember from five, uh, from the trailer, cause I remember the trailer mm -hmm. playing a lot when it was coming out is that I remember the moment in the trailer where The Rock's giving a speech to his team, his squad, and he's like, you're they're dangerous, or this, or that. And then it always and it ends with, and whatever you do, don't let them get into cars. Like, that's, you know, so, like, I think he's hunting them in five. Uh, okay, regardless, I know eventually, even if it's not five, eventually, they will be back in the FBI building. Yes. They will be acting as the Avengers of cars. <laughs> I get it. But I, I'm happy that they're not in the system anymore i'm yes. happy that we can just make it good guys versus bad guys rather than the system versus Do, our team versus bad guys yeah, in some honestly, weird the triangle other, the other thing that i'm happy is probably done at this point is i i never want to see any undercover nonsense ever again oh yeah i absolutely. am so freaking sick of the, the undercover parts of all these movies have been the worst parts they've been yeah. the worst element of them all and i am so thankful that i'm pretty sure that come next movie, it's just about a heist and the rocks chasing after them and whatever. And whatever ridiculous nonsense is coming. I, I guess Michelle Rodriguez maybe isn't in the next one, but I'm sure she's back for like six. I mean, I we I went to the movies recently and I got a trailer for... Ten. I think yeah. ten. And she's getting out of a car yeah. and she's not dead, so... And somewhere it wasn't, in there. It, it, it wasn't a hearse. You're, you're sure? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Unless those hearses are very sporty nowadays. 
Oh dear. It's so funny that this movie now is 14 years old, so mm-hmm. like everyone is getting a bit on the older side now. It's all yeah. interesting to see uh like by the time it wraps up they'll all be old enough to have like kids who are old as old as they were in the first movie. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm sure they already do. I'm I'm positive that's already a thing that's happened. Uh, maybe I don't know. Um so we'll see. But yeah, we got uh Oh no, oh my god. What? I don't like surprises. What? Vince is back in the next one. God damn no! <laughs> oh my! Oh Jesus! The one guy that I thought we were safe from. <laughs> Angry man Vince is back in Fast Five. I did not know he was going to pop back up. That's incredible. Oh well. This really oh. is the Avengers now. It's. Oh yeah, because he's someone that we're all. Vince played by Mark for. Ruffalo. <laughs> Mark Ruffalo. <laughs> Replacing the Hulk, you know. All right, okay. Before we go, before we go, there's one scene that we glossed over that we have to mention because of the absurdity and awkwardness of it. So it's when Dom and Brian... Brian just came over to say, hey, I'm coming with you to go and take out the bad guy. Right. And he looks over and Mia's just coming home with some uh, groceries. Yeah. And... He makes eye contact and she looks upset. So Brian walks off to go and help her. And like Dom and him have just had like a moment where Dom's like saying, hey, help me with this engine. And he's like, you know, press that thing. And he just walks away because he goes to talk to Mia. He goes Mm -hmm. in the kitchen and she... Did they even say much to each other here? Is she just emotional? She's crying and he walks up, grabs her shoulder and says, hey, and that's it. And then kisses her. And then they start furiously kissing and undressing on the kitchen counter. And all I could think in this scene was that her brother is like right outside working on the car and Brian just walked off to have sex with her. And they're like, what, 15, 20 feet away from him, maybe? Yep. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. And it cuts to like after this when they're leaving and like me is saying goodbye to Dom. And I'm like, you just like, Port Brian in the kitchen like 10 yeah. minutes ago. What? I, I think her line exactly was like, how do I say goodbye to my only brother? And I just imagine Vin Diesel being like, that's what you're thinking? How do you say goodbye to the dude who just, you know? How do I say goodbye to my own brother? Vin Diesel should have been like, uh, you could uh, not had sex with my best friend. Uh, yeah. 10 feet away from me that, Here's that the would thing. have been I'm, nice i'm having i'm having trouble remembering in the first movie did they have like a super established relationship they had sex at least once because it was that scene where right she woke up next to him yeah but did 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 dom know about it yeah my yeah question. because he, he knew about it and he said if you break her heart i'll break your neck that was that's line right in the first one yet somehow his uh neck is not broken here well, there was, there was even Weird. a joke earlier in this where when they met to oh, the yeah. bad guy that they know each other, he's like, I used to date my sister. And he's like, oh, you're a lucky man, Brian. He's like, why? Because you're not dead. Yeah. Which, oh, by I the mean, way, D- Dom still drinks nothing but Corona. You see oh, him yeah. with, like Corona constantly throughout this he movie. He it like three times over oh. the course of this movie by name. But uh, no, I think the only explanation as to why Dom did not catch them is that it was over like really quick <laughs> i think that's just about it i guess he, he was revving the engine he didn't hear anything yeah he's like he's probably he probably heard something like is that my sister making sex noises let me just rev the engine some loudly yeah, some more so that's the fuel injection it. system vroom 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 guys <laughs> anywho that is our thoughts on fast and the furious four um david would you like to rate the movie out of 10 no not really <laughs> well, tough you did it anyway. All right. If I had to, I do think that it is... It's fun to go into the middle drag significantly. I think this is more so the bridging movie. And there was trivia at one point I saw of Vin Diesel basically wanted to film 4 and 5 together at the same time. Mm. And it was only the studio that pushed back and said, well, let's let's make sure people are still interested in 4. We can change this up on a dime if we don't need you anymore. Well, he got so, his uh, wish later on then, because uh, I'm sure 10 and 11 were shot oh, back absolutely. to back. And maybe some of the other ones were shot back to back. Mm-hmm. But um, I think this is more so 
the bridge between, all right, we finally figured out what we want to do with this series, and we're going to move forward with it. It brought back old characters. It tied up some loose ends and plots. It feels like we this is done with phase one of the fast universe. It's so, and, it's so weird that they even felt and need to do a bridge but like yeah. if they actually had had the plans in mind for what it was going to be coming five and they might have had some broad outlines i'm not convinced they had the whole thing like thought oh but, i'm sure not but like if they had the broad outline it's so weird to me that justin lynn directed tokyo drift of all things and then did this one and then did the one that as far as reputation would have it is the one that kind of established what the franchise really is going forward and was mm -hmm. the you know Fast Five was more successful than any of the previous films by a significant oh, yeah. margin, and it's because it's the shorter title. They saved on words, <laughs> so it's just wild to me that it went through this transition with the same person at the helm, which mm -hmm. is kind of wild. But and the same writer too, the, oh, the same oh, guy wrote geez, it since that... Tokyo Drift. That is so weird. That is so weird. Yep. Um. It's almost like Tokyo Drift was an addition, and then Vin Diesel was like, okay, I think I trust this guy now. We'll come back. We'll do it properly. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like, if they wanted to go to just straight Fast Five, and like, this is what the movie's going to be, like, we wanted this this heist, like, team movie, mm -hmm. then they could have just, like, everything this movie did, you could have done in, like, a five-minute prologue scene. You could have just quickly oh, been yeah. like, ah, oh, Brian, you know, left the, the authorities after the second movie and went to find Dom. We start with them sort of awkwardly patching things up. Like, okay, go. Let's do a heist. But I'm almost more appreciative of the fact they didn't. They decided to take their time and show the full bridge of them gaining each other's respect back, of Brian le fully leaving for certain the FBI now. Because when we left him at the end of 2, he was still technically like working with the cops mm -hmm. at the very least. And this is now a full break of, no, he's on the... like. He had his record clear, and now he's still back to full outlaw again. So I appreciate the fact they took their time with the whole movie and decided to tell this story of how did we get to everyone's on the wrong side of the law now. Mm -hmm. So yeah. with all that said and done, I'm going to say that this movie is a 5.5. 5. I think that the entire mm. middle of it dragging just brings it down a bit too much to give it the full 6, but I really appreciate the intro, and I definitely appreciate the outro. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I'll just go a straight 5 on this one. Uh, you know, I appreciated some of the setup and how they cross paths for the first half of the movie, but I think it kind of mm. fell apart after that. Um, I don't think the villains are entertaining. What you know, the mystery and the twist of it, or any any part of it. Well, I didn't really think the villain was good in two. At least he was cartoony enough that I got, I got a chuckle out of how outlandish oh, yeah. he was. Here, it was just kind of boring. Um, Honestly, I don't think unless they really prove me wrong with some crazy thing later down the road, I don't think any of the villains are really who we care about. I don't think it's ever going to be a thing where we're going to get great villains. I think it's all about the protagonists and their struggles and such. I mean, that's fair, but, like, if I don't love that, then I'm going to look at the villain next. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I I think this one I'm rating higher than one in three, because I do think there's at least a few things in there that I feel like it is trying to bring things together in a way. Um, there's a couple of those annoying little Fast and the Furious tendencies at points, but it, it does feel a bit more muted compared to before. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Despite the fact that there's a lot of girl and girl kissing randomly for no reason. But I, I cannot stress how 13 years old the audience is. <laughs> they really are. It's, uh, I just, I can't imagine, like, you know, you're, I suppose you're not a working actor because you're an extra who's been hired just to kiss, like, to dress yeah. like this and kiss another woman. But I could only really just imagine, like, the, the feeling of, like, that's the gigs you get. I mean, it's entirely possible, though unlikely, they were adult film stars, where it's like, oh, cool, I'm on an actual movie. I can send this to my mom and dad. And then they get on set and they're like, oh, <laughs> I can't send this to mom and dad. I, I mean, no, no, I don't think for just kissing it would be. Like, I, I see no. why you're saying that, because there's definitely scenes where they'll have, like, orgies or stuff, and a lot of the background players will be porn stars because they're clearly yeah. comfortable with this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I, I think for this it wouldn't be. I think it's, this is no. just, like, this is actors who have not made it yet who are willing to take the paycheck 
Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> this is basically it. I mean, obviously, this is Gal Gadot's pretty much first movie appearance, and she's willing to go without a bra, so make of that what you will. I'm just I'm I'm just imagining like is that the director who's made that choice? Is he is he said to the costume people, I don't want her to wear a bra in this scene. I can't say for certain director, but it's definitely someone with pull. It's not the costume designer saying, No, 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 hear me out, guys. I really don't think she would be wearing one for character reasons. It's just it's just, it's an interesting uh it's just it's interesting to think about how the chain of command made this choice assuming mm -hmm. it wasn't just her herself that went hey i think it'd be cool if my character wasn't run a bra if it was if that was the case then fair enough oh, like, yeah. I, I have nothing to say about it absolutely but it's just it's the idea of like you know we think it would be good for this scene it's important for your character mm -hmm. that we can see your nipples a little bit <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes Pete. and it was because that's all we've talked about her character for uh, I mean, right. what I, else is she got going no, on? No, you're in right. This movie? You're absolutely right. But I'm I'm somehow thinking that when she shows back up in five, six, seven, or whatever, that's not going to be the focus of her character anymore. I mean, I'll laugh if it is. That would be hilarious. Maybe, maybe she'll show. Maybe her first scene in five, she won't be running a bra again, just so we can recognize her, and then she can uh, start. <laughs> it just starts on the chest and then goes up to her face, and we're like, "Oh, Gal Gadot." <laughs> so. Before we leave, we do have to say, does it make the cut? And I'm no. actually, I no, I'm actually willing to fight for cutting it close. I'm willing to put in a little fight there. I think it's, but I think it does it, enough even, things. But even you rated this lower than two, and that didn't okay, make well, the cut. I rated it at the same. I'm, I'm not saying that rating has anything to do with this rating, as is obvious on our Patreon exclusive show of extra reels. Okay, for five dollars and up, but. I I I think that this one, if you're talking about building a collection of these Fast and Furious movies for what we consider to be the Fast and Furious sort of genre, I think this is the first step. And I think that that is enough to give it making the cut status. No. <laughs> well, then we're at an impasse. <laughs> you know, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Okay. making the cut it's not it's not just like in the bubble of the franchise it's not like oh you're collecting these movies does this one make the cut no no mm -hmm. like does the franchise as a whole never mind the movies in it or the, is, is the franchise making the cut right ask yourself that question first it is entirely possible that an entire franchise cannot make the cut that's point number one point number two i bet you i bet you when we watch five you can watch five as the first one in the franchise oh, and never and never need to go back. And I don't doubt that. I, I don't doubt that. But based off your earlier point, I would like to point out that the Santa Claus one made the cut comfortably. Was it comfortable? I don't know if it was comfortable. It's not cutting it close. So it's comfortably. I think that this at least deserves to be on the shelf for some people. That's the clarification we made. This is where it's a judgment call. Cutting it close is where it's a judgment call. And the fact that we're split on it, I think, is <coughs> evidence enough that it's a judgment call. Santa Claus is more deserving than this movie, though. Woof. Them's fighting words in some part of the country. I, 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 oh, anyway, we're not even debating making the cut. It's never. There's no world in which this makes the cut. What we're debating no, sorry, is, cutting it close. Yeah, we're cutting debating it close. cutting the close versus doesn't make the cut. But we said before the cutting of close is the judgment call, and I think this is where it comes down to it, because I think it is, for some people, worth it. I mean, I just can't get on board. I mean, if if I have to accept cutting it close just to end this conversation, I will, but I'm doing it under protest. Fair enough. Protest, but I, you hear me? I take a win as a, it doesn't matter if you win by an inch or a mile. <laughs> winning is winning. All right, if that's the case, then no, it's not kind of close. It, is, <laughs> it does not make the cut. I'm pulling rank. All right, I will give you, I will give you this veto here. But if the next one I think makes the cut, you have to at least give me that. Wait, 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 wait. So if you think yep. the next one makes the cut, it has to get that makes the cut status. Yeah, you're pulling a veto here. I can pull a veto on the next one. 
Yeah, but what if I'm like two rankings away from you? That's that's nonsense. That's what the veto is, man. I don't no, know. What the, you want. the veto should be between the, the 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 two that are next to each other. All right, fair enough. If they're next to each other, I get to win. <laughs> and the next one in this franchise, I agree. Okay. Okay. Fine. All right. I will give up, but I will let you know that my thing is now under protest as well. <laughs> I think it should have been making the cut, or sorry, cutting it close, but I am willing to give you your little petty win here. <laughs> that petty about this win. I'm petty about it. <laughs> well, that's, that's a petty loss then, not a petty win. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right, that that is uh, that is the show that has been our thoughts on Fast and Furious 2009. Uh, you can, of course, support all the content and keep it all coming by going to patreon.com slash TV. And $3 and up, you get a bonus episode once a month. Uh, the bonus episode that tied into the Fast and Furious season was Baker Boys, which we've not recorded yet, but it came out with the first episode. So I'm sure uh, it's high quality and amazing the whole way through. It sounds like the, one of the worst things I'm ever going to watch, quite frankly. <laughs> uh, but we're not recording until after, but it'll be up the same week as the, the first Fast and Furious uh, so it'll already be out and then at the $5 tier you get our other bonus monthly show Extra Reels where we do a, like a really bad like obscure so bad it's good kind of movie hopefully mm. so yeah do we want to tell them what we picked for this month? I can't read the schedule what, what, what is the what is this this month? was uh, this was Terry's most recent suggestion of Christian Mingle the movie yeah we've not recorded it yet so I don't know how angry I am about that yet <laughs> I've already watched it I'm angry. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so, yeah, and obviously there's bonuses for other Mail Fuzz Movies uh, podcasts on Patreon as well. So, uh, by all means, uh, go and uh, have a look and see if you're interested. Uh, all all in any support keeps all the, the content coming, including this show. So, uh, thank you very much. Of course, you can support us for free by liking, subscribing, dinging the bell for notification on YouTube. You can rate the audio podcast five stars on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast from. But any and all help is appreciated. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Keep watching movies. And now you know why they call Brian a 10 second man, right? <laughs> <laughs>